Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is Kenny Irons. I cover our UK and Swiss liquidity solutions and I joined Amundi three years ago from Credit Agricole's Corporate Investment Bank. I would like to give a very warm welcome to our panel who I will let introduce themselves. Maybe Rob if you'd like to start. Hi, I'm uh, Robert Scriven. I'm the Group Treasurer and Planning Manager from Cairn Energy PLC. Um, I've been in Cairn uh, longer than I remember. Um, Cairn is a London FTSE 250 listed oil and gas exploration company. Thank you, Rob. Benoit, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, you're on silent. No, we still can't hear you. <laughs> no, maybe Andrew, you can help in technology. Yeah. Well, yeah. Maybe two can you hear me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, sorry. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Benoit Pallier. Um, I've been working at Amundi for quite a few years, around 15 now. Uh, I started as money market trader. And for 10 years, I've been managing um, money market funds, short terms and standard in euro and dollar uh, with a strong focus on liquidity and uh, security and a strong involvement, more and more involvement in uh, ESG. And last but not least, Timothy. Hello, everyone. Uh, Timothy Jolan, heading ESG business development and advocacy for Amundi Group. So we face pretty much all investment platforms as well as client segments to help grow uh, ESG business in general, integration, mobilization, and also with various stakeholders. I have a background in investment solution engineering, mostly for ESG solution uh, towards institutional clients. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for joining. So for, just to start off, for those who are not familiar with Amundi Asset Management, just very quickly, uh, we are a French asset manager, which is part of the Credit Agricole Group. And we were created uh, just over 10 years ago through the merger of Credit Agricole Asset Management and Société Générale Asset Management. We have more than 30 years experience in responsible investments in Europe. And in 2006, we were a founding signatory of the United Nations Principle of Responsible Investments. Uh, this is therefore a topic which has been part of our core strategy from the beginning. And we are proud to say that Morningstar have recognized Amundi as the leading asset manager in ESG. Today, uh, we are going to discuss this, obviously this popular topic and how it, it can become part of your short-term strategy. Um, also the key drivers to improve, how to build and demonstrate the, the long-term value. And finally, the impact on short-term gain and loss on return on investments. So before uh, just a little housekeeping uh, for the audience, there's a Q&A toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen with about and then participate. So please don't hesitate throughout to send through your questions. Uh, we will endeavor to try and uh, answer those depending obviously on timings. And then uh, th this session, as you probably already know, but on the second day is recorded. So you can always come back to it and listen to it again. Finally, do get engaged on ACT uh, Media and we do also have an exhibition stand should you, you know, wish to get any further information. So to get started, I have a question for you, Rob, to begin with. Um, as you're starting the process, uh, why, in your view, um, has ESG become so important for a treasurer? ESG is obviously an important issue for us all, and we all have to be doing our part. Cairn Energy, especially in the industry we're in, has always had a strong approach to environmental, social and HSE matters. That's backed up by international standards and the host governments we work with. And we always, in all the areas we operate, have a number of programs operating on the environmental and social areas. And everything we do involving drilling seismic and operations generally requires an environmental impact assessment. So it's always a keen area for us. But, you know, as the world moves forward and climate change becomes the bigger, a bigger issue, then it's much more important now going forward that we 
engage with our ESG in all areas. And that's really where um, Treasury needs to also do its part to support that in you know, looking at how it invests and supporting the ESG programmes. Indeed, and your rating actually is above average on each pillar of ESG, which is great. So just quick question, you know, maybe sort of regarding your shareholders. Are they giving you guidelines or influencing the way to move forwards on either the ESG part or your short term investments policy? I wouldn't say guidelines, but there's definitely a strong interest from all our shareholder base, which includes a lot of institutional investors and from all the lenders. And when we're um, bidding in countries as well, we have to show that we are supporting a strong ESG strategy. Mm -hmm. yeah, it definitely becomes more interesting. Um, and so maybe Timothy as a, you know, the same question on for an asset manager, why is it so important? Well, it comes from a, a very simple fact is, is the realization that ESG factors can have a, a material impact on the performance of, of the portfolios we, we manage. And then we've been integrating ESG factors actually for decades now. And, and, and it has been proven uh, very empirically, I would say, in, in, a, in our portfolio management on a, on a daily basis. But, but there is perhaps more to that uh, in, in you know, really understanding where uh, Amundi's commitment is coming from. So there is a, a fiduciary uh, duty component, which is critical. And then we, we really do have this conviction that we are generating additional value for our clients. But we are also very much aware of the positive impact we can have uh, on society by integrating ESG uh, factors in the way we manage portfolio, but also in our stewardship policy, in our dialogue with the various companies we, we invest in. So we do not provide uh, guidelines, uh, as Rob put it. We, we would rather see it as, as potential guidance. And, and we, we really see ourselves, uh, we want to, to, to be uh, at least in, in a position which is very constructive in, in helping companies progressing on their ESG journey. And as a corporate shareholder or as a debt holder, we believe that this is a way to reduce risk and generate value for our clients while, while enhancing the, the value of our portfolios. Uh, more recently, there has been uh, additional uh, elements that, that really were uh, driving forces, uh, critical forces in the increased mobilization around ESG. One, of course, is uh, the fact that society changed and, and, and the appetite for a sustainable product has increased uh, very materially. And, and, and we have witnessed as a global asset manager uh, also a shift in market demand from perhaps you know, a, a topic which was very much institutional investors based, uh, very much coming from Europe to a global topic, which is now a cross segment topic to the extent that we see ESG demand from institutional investors, private bank and distributors and, and all retail markets. Uh, the third force at play, and that relates to ESG integration by corporates, but also uh, the willingness of asset manager to integrate ESG is of course regulation. Uh, we live now in a world where uh, regulators have understood uh, the, uh, that finance is a potential driving force in terms of changing society. And they are looking to mobilize capital market, financial sector in general, to support energy and ecological transition goal. To me, that is very clear in understanding uh, the agenda of the European Commission, but that this has already uh, been the case in other jurisdictions, like in China, in Latin America, and then we expect to see more and more regulations like that. So I guess, Benoit, how's that implemented on the sort of short-term cash and money market funds? Uh, this is a real important issue for us, especially uh, for short-term cash. As mentioned by, by Timothée, uh, public opinion and financial market are increasingly sensitive to ESG issues and all companies are accountable. Uh, an investor, whatever uh, its asset class, will have to focus more on more on uh, ESG because it can induce volatility 
just like financial issues, in fact. And uh, this extra volatility does not comply with money market fund patterns. Uh, so we all have in mind some car makers, some uh, banks, some mining company that has to face uh, environmental, social, or government problem not so not long time ago. And each time when this uh, problem went public, the stocks or the securities of these um, mining companies, uh, 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 bank or car makers were eat and, and fell. Even the short-term ones that, uh, that were eligible to money market funds. And this was not necessarily because of uh, an immediate financial impact, but on the longer term, it could wait on the financial stability of a company and to its reputation, what can be even worse. So uh, as mentioned by, by, by Timothée, we have the conviction at Amundi that uh, the inclusion of env environment, uh, social and governance criteria in investment policies has a positive impact on financial performances. Uh, in fact, ESG indicators, uh, ESG criteria are leading indicators uh, that allows, uh, alongside with a traditional financial analysis, to assess the future situation of a company. So it must be included in the process. Um, some studies released not long time ago by independent entities tend to demonstrate that ESG money market fund yield is similar to non-ESG uh, non ones. Uh, when we look at our own range at Amundi on the money market funds, uh, in Euro, we reach the same conclusion. So, in fact, uh, the SRI or ESG filter is not an impediment for a money market fund. I would even dare say that it is a legitimate framework. Uh, now, asset manager must balance not only financial risk and rewards, but also extra financial risk and rewards. Uh, and in this sense, ESG criteria is an extra security for our clients and for our investor. And it is thus essential to implement these factors in our investment decisions. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a very good point. So, I, Rob, following uh, Benoit's comments, I mean, do you know the, the key path you'd be looking to take for, for your investment world, including uh, ESG? Well, it's, it's good to hear from Benoit, first of all, the two are compatible um, because we're just starting out on this move or journey towards ESG investment. So I think, you know, we'll, we'll be starting by evaluating our investment choices and looking at the measures and criteria that are being used to make sure that we're <clears throat> selecting ESG investments that are as best compatible with our own ob objectives. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly in the case of money market funds where there's quite a good degree of clarity. Um, so it will be, we're not clear on that whether there's sufficient supply at the moment for our level of investments, but hopefully there is and over time it will grow. So it will be a journey along that road to be fully ESG invested. Yeah. Do, do you, I mean, does return on investment come into question when you're looking at that? Well, we would look at it, but in the past, it's never been the number one objective. That's always, mm -hmm. for a treasurer, it's always preservation of capital. Mm -hmm. And once you've achieved the minimum level of risk that's acceptable to you, you would seek to maximize the return on investment. I think I see it the same way. Mm. Um, minimum ESG, minimum preservation of capital, and then look at the return on investment after that. Mm -hmm. But if we can do both at the same time and not affect it, then that sounds good from Benoit's point of view. Absolutely. So, I mean, taking into consideration your company's sector, I mean, do you have any key points that are more important than others? Not any in particular, but I, I think generally there's always a greater focus on our sector. Mm. Um, and therefore, if we want to continue to uh, attract capital, then we need to be showing there are cut above other industries in, in certain mm. instances. So definitely there's a greater focus. Mm. So I suppose leading on for that, Timothy, uh, would you be able to give more insight on the ESG points that can help treasurers? Well, uh, sure. Huh? You, you have to realize that when it comes to uh, ESG policy, there are a, a few building blocks that, that matter. 
Uh, number one is the, the scoring or the evaluation of, of company taking into account ESG factors that, that Rob mentioned. Uh, this is uh, really critical. Uh, number two is how this is then integrated in your overall investment process, in your investment policy. And, and that can be adapted to the specificities of a given asset class, of a given geography. And number three, uh, which is more relevant for a global portfolio is of course the way you engage, the way you try to influence company uh, through voting or, or simple uh, corporate dialogue. So, so focusing on the first, uh, at Amundi we, we have built a proprietary ESG scoring system which is very much metality focused and, and which is a very flexible to the extent that we would have materiality matrices, which are really designed at the sector level. And, and we have uh, roughly 70 different sectors with 70 different ESG materiality matrices that we use. And as a result of that, we would weight each and every uh, ESG criteria that we use differently depending on their materiality, on their relevance in a given sector. And, and when I speak about materiality, I, I mean two things. First of all, uh, the fact that it can have a material impact on the, the financial value of a, a company, of uh, the, the holdings that you have in your portfolio linked to that company. And so it's really about uh, the, the likelihood of, of an impact and the significativity of, of that impact for sure. And we also take into account the, this double materiality concept, which is the impact uh, that a company can have on its own ecosystem to the extent that uh, this matters for us as a corporate citizen. But as you can imagine, we live in a world where there are feedback loops between the double uh, materiality and, and the first one in the more traditional uh, sense. Mm -hmm. So scoring evaluation in line with your values, in line with your uh, investment conviction, is, is paramount. Uh, then in terms of investment process, there are obviously different ways. Uh, exclusion of, of the laggards is, uh, is one option. And, and we see, of course, many investors, many portfolio, excluding the, 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 the companies which are really lagging behind. So, so just to give you an example, at a Mundi level, we have a scoring uh, scale which ranges from G to A. A being the best performers, G the worst performers, we would exclude G rated companies uh, across the board. And then the way we integrate those signals uh, would very much depend on the portfolio we manage. We, for some portfolios, exclude uh, F and E rated companies and then have additional portfolio performance objective. We also try to work a lot in terms of taking into account uh, the dynamic of, a, of an ESG rating, uh, notably by taking into account ESG momentum uh, of, certain, uh, of certain signals. And, um, and just one word of conclusion on you know, uh, the fact that we've, we have actually set ESG performance objective for all our actively managed funds. Mm. So, so the level of uh, integration of ESG within our, our companies is now almost to up to 100%. And, and that's really a, a testimony of the fact that we believe our scoring system does bring value to, to portfolio management. And then all our portfolio managers have access to those ratings and complementary analytics on a daily, daily basis in their portfolio management tools. Mm, thank you, Timothée. So, I mean, it, you know, for you, Benoit, as a portfolio manager, how do you integrate that into your, into your, your, the funds that you manage? Uh, first of all, managing a money market fund means um, operating in a street framework. We have guidelines from regulators, from credit trading agencies, from uh, clients, and also our own internal, internal guidelines. Uh, among these guidelines, these constraints, these internal constraints, ESG policy is a key factor at Amundi uh, that we have to take into account before uh, any investment uh, alongside with the usual financial liquidity, credit quality criteria, we have to check in the, the tools that um, Timothée just described if the investment matches our mainstream ESG approach. Uh, 
this 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 approach as uh, as described by uh, by Timothy, uh, we exclude some worst rated issuer on the money markets uh, fund it's fng uh, just to 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 go a little bit further g um, g rated issuer are for example the one that do not comply with the united nation global compact uh, principles uh, we also exclude in in our money market funds some sectors like tobacco or coals for example and we have to um, to beat our universe reference in in terms of global rating of the portfolio, in terms of weighted average rated of the, of the portfolio. Um, to we, we have to beat our universe of, of reference with a, I would say a sufficient coverage, of course, um, in order to have a, a relevant uh, a relevant score. Um, Beside that, in addition of that, some uh, some of our money market funds were granted some uh, or, or have, I would say, extra level of ESG. So for our money market funds, for example, we were granted the French SRI labels uh, that is uh, promoted by the French Ministry of Economy and Finance. And with this label, we have extra constraints, extra guidelines that we must comply with. Um, so we need to uh, beat the reference universe that is uh, excluding excluding 20% of the lower rated issuer and with a 90% coverage ratio. So it's, it's a strong constraint. We also have uh, two impact indicators that we have to, to beat. Uh, one is carbon intensity. The other one is human right, respect, decent work and freedom of, uh, of association. Um, and so this, this, all these constraints make our, I, say, I would say, our ESG approach more relevant. But of course, in other asset classes and in other portfolio, we can have uh, different levels, different constraints or uh, thematic to match the need of our customers. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I mean, t talking about policies, obviously one that uh, no doubt many people have heard of is the SFDR, the European Commission's uh, initiative on sustainable finance disclosure regulation um so to summarize it that sort of disclosing esg information it's a shared system of definition and classification of sustainable economic uh activities via european taxonomy um sustainability benchmarks as well where there'll be a creation of two benchmark categories with low carbon emissions and then obviously in advisory services, uh, looking at amending NIFID 2 in the IDD, which is the Insurance Distribution Directive. Right? So a question for the panel. I mean, you know, what's your view of this regulation, this new regulation for corporate treasures? Because it's certainly, um, a, you know, a topic that is coming up uh, quite often and a little bit of confusion for some with regards to the various articles. So maybe uh, if we could start with you, Timote, if you want to pick that up first, and then obviously we can pass on to Rob as a treasurer and Benoit. Well, I will not speak on behalf of Rob. Huh? I'm not putting myself in the <laughs> of treasure, Rob. But maybe from the, the viewpoint of a, an asset manager, I mean, you've named quite a few uh, key regulations, and, and I think it's very important to, to take all those regulations together. Because it is only when you take them all together that you realize the potential they bear. Uh, because it's, it's on the one hand, of course, a, an obligation to, to classify financial product and to be very transparent in the way you integrate uh, ESG uh, in your investment process. It's additional reporting uh, requirements, uh, but, but, but it, it needs to be understood together with the regulation on taxonomy uh, because your very uh, high intensity product will need to report on their exposure to sustainable investment and within the share of sustainable investment, the share of assets which are complying with a European taxonomy. So that's one really uh, you know, critical element where you need to think about the taxonomy and SFDR together. And, and when it comes to uh, your particular relationship with corporate, SFDR needs to be understood with NFDR uh, the, the, the regulation which is specifically aiming a non-financial 
uh, disclosure by uh, corporates. And, and of course, uh, financial product, we need to report on a wealth of extra uh, financial indicators, which will be brought to the market by corporates. So once again, you know, the, 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 really the potential for change of that regulation needs to be understood, taking into account uh, several regulations together. And, and to connect the dots with uh, MIFI 2 and NIDD that you've mentioned, uh, SFDR needs to be understood alongside with that regulation as well. To the extent that financial advisors, we need to take into account the sustainable preferences of the end savers and, and put in front of uh, those different pref uh, sustainability preferences Preference levels, the right offering that match their appetite for sustainable product. And, and you have uh, various ingredients, but that together are, are uh, we believe, a very powerful recipe for a, you know, further mobilization of, of European uh, financial markets uh, in terms of ESG, in terms of responsible investing, in terms of sustainable investment objective, and of course, within that space, uh, impact product. So what does that mean to conclude for a treasurer? What does it mean for a corporate? What does it mean for any entity uh, which will, uh, from time to time, need to tap capital market to get access to financing? Uh, ESG is becoming uh, more and more uh, critical. And, and, and there is uh, really a, a risk for, uh, for any uh, corporate to basically not get access to the broad set of potential uh, financing options if uh, they do not comply with these increased ESG requirements, which are the result, if you wish, of this sustainable finance package. Mm -hmm. so, so we have yet to see uh, all the consequences of the regulations, but we expect them to be uh, long lasting uh, and, and quite material and, and significant. Mm, absolutely. Rob, what's your, what's your view on that? The, the regulations are obviously very helpful because they give the transparency and mm. therefore the information that we need to make our investment decisions. But I think, you know, looking at something like Article 8, let's, let's kind of think of that as like a minimum, a minimum standard to meet Article 8. And, you know, individual funds or investments are going to perform above that to a certain extent, hopefully. Mm. And, but but the information we can get through that regulation will enable us to look at the policies say, of a Monday against somebody else and the scoring and see how they're achieving against their benchmarks and then focus our investment decisions to so hopefully improve above Article 8. Mm, mm, absolutely. I guess, I, I suppose for you, Benoit, how does this affect the management of the funds? Uh, in fact, not that much. Um... As already mentioned, we're engaged in SRI or ESG for years. And uh, so the implementation of all these rations is not, it's not fact. Uh, what we had to do, of course, is uh, was, was to classify the, or, or funds, of course, um, with the SFDR regulation um, between under Article 6, Article 8, or Article 9. Um, since we have an explicit uh, ESG element, you know, documentation or in our management, we cannot be classified Article 6 uh, as it uh, only, uh, only funds that uh, do not mention ESG are classified Article 6, but we cannot neither be classified uh, under Article 9 as uh, the objective of a fund is not only sustainable investment, but also to provide our customers with liquidity and security, which are also very important objective for money market fund. And that is the reason why all our funds are classified under Article 8. But obviously, uh, all those regulations uh, are very positive as they allow much more transparency, as mentioned by Rob and Timote, as it enhances uh, the quantity and the quality of information disclosed, what is essential to have elements of comparison between asset managers and companies and also uh, to compare products. Um, but also what is a 
a key element, I think, is that it steers private investment toward more responsible uh, investment. And this is, this is a key for the future times. Yes, no, absolutely. And it, it'll be a space to watch. I mean, as you said, you know, Mundi's funds are all registered under Article 8. So it's definitely a step forwards. And, uh, you know, uh, it'll be interesting to see where we are a year down the line at the next ACT on that point. Um, so um, obviously, we've just we're still going through a pandemic. And on, for those uh, not in the UK, uh, we, we've just been prolonged for another four weeks. Uh, on our liberties. So I just maybe Rob, in your opinion, you know, what are the key drivers for corporates to improve, you know, how they build and demonstrate their long term value after this whole, you know, year of lockdown? Well, we, we've always seen great global issues. And this is a, another one that highlights the importance of ESG to help equality in the world. So this is really a good opportunity for treasurers to do their bit in terms of following ESG and support the overall company and wider strategy. Mm, yeah. And as as the panel suggested, it's essential if we're going to maintain access to capital as well. No, oh, absolutely. Very valid point. Um, then Timothy, your comments? Well, when the, the crisis unraveled, there, there were a few unknown, right? Uh, you know, what, what would be the impact on the, the performance of, of ESG funds? Uh, that's one. What would be impa the impact on the, the mobilization of policymakers on, on their sustainable uh, agenda? Uh, that was a, a second. And, and what would be the, the impact uh, actually of, of consumers in terms of their overall appetite for a sustainable product? And on these three fronts, if you want, we were uh, reassured. On, on the first one, if you look at fund flows, actually uh, ESG funds perform much better than, than non-ESG funds. And, and if you take, uh, if you look back at the 2020 year, Actually, we've seen increased inflows in mutual funds uh, in the vicinity of plus 100 percent, whereas it was relatively flat for non-ESG mutual funds. And in the midst of the crisis, these were actually even more uh, significant. In terms of performance of, of ESG assets, it was very interesting to see that this was the time where social pillar uh, became more significant. Whereas when you, when you look at our quantitative study results of the past 10 years, the two most significant pillars from 2010 to 2019 were environment and, and governance pillar. So social pillar became relevant, significant and material. And, and we expect that it's going to, to have a prolonged uh, effect. And, and the third is, is, of course, on this uh, policy agenda which is having an impact on uh, the materiality of ESG factors on the one hand, and also on the mobilization of financial actors on the second. And, and there is a positive feedback loop between the two because this has an impact on equilibrium prices. Uh, we were uh, reassured as well huh, because the, the EU sustainability agenda has never been as ambitious as today. And, and we're glad to see that the UK uh, is on the same page uh, in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. Benoit, your thoughts? Um, yeah, the, the, the COVID crisis uh, that we've been through uh, has deepened inequalities. Uh, environmental respect uh, has not been a priority for a lot of people and firms. And uh, uh, the COVID-19 by reshuffling or life and work organization uh, has raised some uh, governance issues. and. Uh, so that will certainly lead to a change of paradigm. Um, in the post-pandemic world, ESG will certainly be a cornerstone for corporate, for financial uh, institutions and for gov governments and politics, as mentioned by, by, by Timothy. And that's what we are starting to, to, to witness with, for example, uh, the uh, next generation EU plan, 
which is on track with at least 30%, 37% of the fund received by state that must be used for ecological transition. Even the ECB uh, has declared that addressing climate change issues is not optional, but essential. Even yesterday, Mrs. Uh, the ECB member Isabel Schnabel said that ECB must uh, use its instruments to take into account climate change consideration. So yes, globally, we uh, can't not do without uh, ESG to promote sustainable growth and to build long-term value. And so uh, we all need to leverage on reliable partners and to track regulatory agenda evolution. And that will be the key to get this extra, or this extra value or this long-term value, I think. Mm, no, absolutely. So, I, 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 so, yeah, no, that's a very valid point. I guess uh, one question that comes to mind is in the short term, is too much money chasing too few ESG assets, quality ESG assets? What are your thoughts there? Uh, I, I think the there are more and more ESG assets. Uh, uh, corporate financial institutions are, are really aware of this uh, of this issue and uh, tend to improve their 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 practices uh, on a daily and on ongoing basis. And so, uh, for investors, this U ESG universe of investment is is is. Um, being broader and broader. So, so I don't think this will be an issue to find the uh, EAG issuers um, in, in, the, in the coming month or, or years. It will, mm. on the contrary, in fact. It, it'll, go, it'll go up, no doubt. Okay, so we only have a few minutes left and um, we have got a few questions from the audience. So uh, Rob, there's one here for you. Um, does Ken have to worry about whether its JV partners will pay the fair share of future long-term ESG costs? No, I don't, I don't really think so. Everybody will prioritise like we already always have in the industry ESG. As I said, it's been a, a long-standing premise of the industry in, in everything we do. Mm -hmm. and, it, and there's a track record of fulfilling obligations. So I don't see why that should be a concern. And we're obliged under our um, contracts with gov host governments anyway. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. There's another question here, uh, probably for Benoit and Timote. At what point does short term become long term? It's probably not a smooth yield curve, but a staircase transition. Either of you or both of you. <laughs> Uh, maybe just to start, and, and Benoit, please feel free to complement to, to pick up on, on, on one of your, your points. Uh, I mean, you have to look at it through uh, an, an efficient market uh, hypothesis or, 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 you know, how much you are uh, removed from a well functioning uh, market. So, so EFG basically uh, signals help you to, to increase your uh, information set. And, and that's really the, the reason why we believe you can generate value within a much uh, a more constrained uh, investment universe. So, so that's one thing to bear in mind. Uh, second is that you want to take into account uh, EAG factors, but, but not on a standalone basis. You need to take into account both uh, financial KPIs, the prices, as well as EAG factors when taking an investment decision which is also critical. There is an ESG risk, but your question as an investor is whether or not you are rewarded for this risk. And, and this is why given exposure to ESG risk is, uh, is critical. When it comes to long-term versus short-term, at the end of the day, what you want to be is in a situation where current price, uh, current uh, risk premia are reflecting uh, uh, those long, medium and, and short-term risk. But, but stating the obvious, we, we are not living in, in a world where all markets are functioning uh, perfectly. And, and typically, when you take the example of, of climate change, this is an area where we believe there is still a largely unpriced risk. And, and that is uh, very much the reason why uh, low carbon uh, solutions, decarbonized solutions have been uh, such a uh, 
a success uh, among among investors. It's really because this is an area where the, the risk is, is seen as material and it's not really reflected in, in current market prices. Mm. No, thank you. Benoit, just a few seconds left. Did you want to add anything there? No? Good. Uh, no, no, I think it's always very clear. Okay, great. Well, listen, we're coming to the end. So thank you to our speakers and the audience for listening or listening when you replay. Um, by all means, please do not hesitate to get in touch if you've got any questions. Obviously, we covered short-term money markets, but the world is big in ESG credentials and you have green bonds, thematic funds, et cetera. So uh, always happy to help in any way we can. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, please feel free to, to visit our virtual exhibition and uh, have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you very much.